beyond the point. So antigen processing and presentation. So for processing, we have major histocompatibility complex 1 and MHC2. MHC1 takes place in the ER, and um, the main, I guess, purpose of all this, or the main, I guess, driving point for the, just for the subject of processing, is the actual proteasome. Remembering that there's two types of proteasome, both the constitutive and the immuno proteasome. The change taking place upon exposure to interferon gamma. So the constitutive proteasome is made up of two parts. There's the beta subunits and then the 19S cap. The beta subunits are, are kind of the proteases themselves. This is the protease catalytic chamber. And then the 19S cap is just involved in the shuffling of proteins to the beta subunits, to the interior. So for the immunoproteasome, it's the same thing, but the only difference is the actual subunits that are associated with each of those. And I don't think that they're too much important, but I wouldn't put it past some uh, professors to ask questions about this. There's the MP7, LMP7, sorry, and MEC1. These two here are, these are proteases. And these are located in the center part of it. And then again on the outside of it, we have the PA28 cap. That's not superbly important with that. So for MHC type 2, well, um, this thing predominantly takes place in the endosomes. And the substance that is involved with the actual breaking down of the peptides is just that, the lysosome. Or you can think of it as the phagolysosome, something that has a lot of those hydrolytic enzymes and proteases that you've probably learned from general biology. All right, so for presentation, there's MHC1 and then there's MHC2. For the MHC1, know that this is a shorter peptide, which we've already kind of talked about for the most part, kind of just for review, but this is dealing with the, MHC2 is dealing with CD8. This is getting itself from the endoplasmic reticulum is where it's gonna come in contact with that stuff. MHC is present in all cells and they both experience uh, promiscuous binding affinity. I'm gonna go ahead and this is all review, so PBS for that, and this occurs to both MHC2 as well. MHC2, this gets it from the endosome and is associated with CD4 T cells. All right, so let's move on to the actual processes, uh, reviewing of the processes of MHC1 peptide loading. First and foremost, we have that wonderful heterodimer of active transport protein known as TAP. TAP is going to be hydrolyzing ATP to actively transport peptides into the endoplasmic reticulum. Actively transporting peptides into the ER. Next thing that we want to mention is calnexin. You can remember this as a C-type lectin. It is insoluble, water insoluble, meaning that it's going to be bound into the membrane of it, the, uh, in this case, the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is a chaperonin for MHC1. Chaperonin for MHC1. So the next thing that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to do it in a different color, and I'm really going to bring it down here, is this thing that is collectively known as the peptide loading complex. So for the parts of this, we have ERP57, tapicin, in cow reticulin, and then lastly, there's ERAP. So tapicin is going to act as a bridge molecule, for one. It's going to make sure that the MHC complex is in close proximity to the TAP molecule, to TAP protein, but it's also going to make sure that the um, process of binding to the antigen um, of the MHC receptor site is a, undergoing a pr favorable circumstances. It's going to ensure that we have the right peptide binding there. Okay, so for ERP57, this is going to be actually attached to tapicin right next to it. So they're, they're connected to each other. This is a thiol reductase, and it's going to stabilize the overall binding process. The way that this works is it's going to protect the disulfide bonds from being reduced themselves. I don't know if you remember from organic chemistry or from biochemistry, but oxidation reduction reactions are how we form disulfide bonds, which are very, very powerful bonds that contribute to the protein's three-dimensional structure exponentially. And so with thiol reductase being there, it's going to kind of protect that from being broken down, from being reduced. 
Next we have is calreticulin, and just like um, with calnexin, calreticulin also is a C-type lectin. It's a chaperonin, but all that you need to know is that it's basically a, a soluble form of calnexin. So I'm just going to call it a soluble calnexin, since I'm writing things that I've already written down. Next is ERAP, and what this is going to do is it's going to remove amino acids on the end terminus one at a time until we have the appropriate size for that peptide to bind. Removing amino acids at the end terminus one at a time until it fits right. Until it can fit. Cool. So all of this stuff in the peptide loading complex in calneculin kind of comes down to this, uh, I guess I'll do it in blue here, this concept known as peptide editing which may make you think, oh, we're going to modify the peptide itself, kind of. What we're going to do is the MHC is going to essentially have every peptide that gets pumped in there is going to temporarily insert itself into the active site because this is such a small space here. So this temporary insertion that goes in the active site is going to, it has to induce a very strong conformational change. Where does it get the energy to do this strong conformational change? That comes from the binding energy, which comes from the stability of the molecule. So we have to have a certain bare minimum of association that we have between the two. And so peptide editing is just that. This is just trial and error, trial and error until the peptide is right. So that's it for MHC class one. Now let's talk about MHC class two peptide loading. And there's really just three things that you need to know about this. First thing we have is the invariant chain. This is going to do three things. This is going to block the peptides from binding to the MHC class 1 in the endoplasmic reticulum. It's going to stabilize the three-dimensional structure of the MHC class 2 because of what we just talked about with the peptide binding there. And then it's also going to help make sure that it delivers itself to the endoplasm or to the endosome, sorry. So it blocks it, it's going to stabilize the MHC, stabilizes it, and then it helps it with the delivery to the endosome. There's also HLADM, or I call it HALADM, <laughs> and this is something that helps with the loading of the peptides to the MHC. Helps with the peptide loading. Okay, and the other things that it does though <laughs> is when we have this peptide loading, this is undergo a conformational change in the MHC type 2 molecules, which is going to result in the release of the clip, which I haven't talked about yet, but we'll talk about that later. With the release of the clip, we now can have peptide binding. So let's say just for some hypothetical situation that you didn't want to have this, this happening here. So you would have HLADO is going to, it's going to basically block the release of the clip. This is actually, fun facts, I guess, this is analogous to that of uh, what Tapasin was doing. Um, this is also going to uh, help it with the the appropriate peptide binds there. So let's just let's just talk about this kind of I guess in, in drawing it. So here's your MHC class two molecule. I'm not going to draw it in, in super uh, well dimensions. HLADM is bound to it. So this is HLADM, and until the appropriate peptide binds to it, that it has enough energy, enough binding energy, which means that the bonds formed between the peptide binding site and the peptide itself are strong enough that it's going to super be a very stable bond, that's, that's the energy barrier, the amount of stability that we have to have to make this over undergo a conformational change which is going to cause HLADM to be released. And that's a really important concept, not just in terms of immunology, but in terms of biochemistry and a lot of other things. And it's, uh, it's like a, a selective, it's setting the bar at a certain length that this bond has to be at least this strong because it had at least this much binding energy, which causes at least uh, enough to do this conformational change, which is going to result in the release of this. So that's, that's how these things work, and that's what makes them really important. There's also this thing that's known as the MHC type 2 compartment. And all that this is, is this is just a, a proteases, if you can think about it, that are going to uh, selectively destroy the invariant chain. IC, invariant chain. So once they destroy the IC, the invariant chain, what we're left with is this thing known as the clip which the clip, in case that wasn't obvious from earlier, this is going to block the, uh, it's going to cover up the binding site for MHC peptides. 